for you, sir. I'm good, Paul. How are you? I'm very good, mate. I'm very good. Um, so I, I was I was checking out your LinkedIn profile when you first got in touch a couple of months back, and um, okay. uh, you've, I think you've been in telecom for as long as I have, although I escaped <laughs> a few years ago. Um, how did you get working into mobile? You've been pretty much with uh, O2 for most of your career, haven't you? I, I have. I've, I've, I've been at O2 or uh, Telefonica or BT, as was a long time ago. Uh, for some time now, so I, actually I first got interested in telecoms and networking uh, many, many years ago um, as a kid having read a book called The Cuckoo's Egg by Cliff Stoll, oh, yeah. which for those who know is actually is, is a book about hacking and freaking. Um, so uh, I actually uh, started working for BT Mobile three hours a night in the, the warehouse in Leeds while I was a student. Uh, so it was a really entry level job. So I'd, I'd pursued a job in telecoms for a, a while by that stage, wanted to do it. Did yeah. work experience at BT. Uh, so I actually wanted to go and work at BT Labs. Um, and by the time I'd got into a position where I potentially could move to BT Labs, uh, BT sold off the mobile arm and I went with O2. Um, so uh, I didn't I didn't sadly uh, get there. However, my, my, actually my, line, my guy, my team line manager, um, actually did work at BT Labs. Um, some time ago, so uh, in, in a sense, I'm a little bit lucky because, of course, BT Labs has been somewhat uh, run down since then. BT don't do much research anymore, anyway. Yeah, uh, so I've, I, I've been around since uh, yeah, a couple couple of decades now in, in telecoms. Yeah, I, I I went out in BT Labs a few times uh, when I worked for them, um, and it was definitely impressive in the early 2000s. And um, funny enough, Orange had their uh, House of the Future as well, which strangely enough, back in what was it? Uh, 99, 2000, they had the connected fridge in there. Um, I was, that's, what it, that's what they called it. Um, but um, yeah, R&D seems to be going more external than internal in companies like BT these days. Um, it's what reducing that cost, which is a shame because they've, they've released some monumental innovation from that place. Um, Absolutely. So, what, um, so, you know, how long ago was it that you got into the IoT side of the business? Uh, so... Actually, I've been so previous prior to working as a solution architect. Um, so I've, I've done this role for about seven years. Prior to that, my, my background is operations. So I was principal in a, in a support team for, for quite a long time. So I've actually been supporting what we might call machine to machine since 2001 uh, mm -hmm. when we had customers, partners launch with GPRS capability. Mm -hmm. um, so so I've, I've supported it for a while um, uh, in the last, last few years of. of done more on the design side excellent and what, what project do you feel most proud of that you've been involved so, so i think probably uh when we set up a team that supports international roaming services a third line support team engineering team um I, the thing i'm proudest about is actually uh, that we had such a sense of fun in a, in a team whose job is basically to go and learn the new protocols as they arrive mm -hmm. um it seems it seems difficult to find fun um and yet we did um so i think actually probably it's a small thing it's in creating a new team uh, and, and having having that team spirit that's yeah. probably actually the thing that i'm proudest of it's it's a small thing but i think mm -hmm. it counts for a lot yeah i, I, I can I'm totally resonate with that uh, with uh, some of the highlights that i've had um, throughout my time and uh, my career, and, and especially in telecom, um, so um, you know we we were chatting with Matt, and Matt was talking about five G. Um, you know, from 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 your view, um, the question that I ask everybody is, what's the real value? What's the real benefits of five uh, G going to deliver? Well, so I, I want to give a facetious answer about coronavirus, um, but in in practice. Um, some of you may be aware from about 15 years ago a thought experiment called IBZL, Infinite Bandwidth Zero Latency, uh, and essentially that, that posits the question, that, that poses the question, um, what happens when your connectivity bandwidth increases to, a, to a, a point that actually effectively it's infinite and your latency falls close enough to zero that effectively it doesn't matter? And whilst there's no clear guidance on what that means, approximately speaking, that's when your bandwidth is a guaranteed 200 megabits a second or so, and your latency is sub 10, 10 milliseconds. Um, and at that sort of point, the thought experiment goes, you start to see potentially some quite interesting things to happen. 
So for me, the most exciting part um, is that most applications of these things don't yet exist, which sounds like a bit of a cop-out answer, um, but actually that's the really exciting part, I think. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. Um, the, the, I mean, is the backhaul there to, to deliver that zero latency with 5G? I mean, does 5G really so deliver I, that speed? I think we are not there quite yet. I think it's fair to say. I think we're almost there in the fixed line space. We're almost there. In the mobile space, not quite. Yeah. And, but, but, but I think the, the promise is there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, we say we say that we're, we're almost there with the fixed space, but... The, the majority of the country, you're lucky if you get past 30 meg um, in broadband at home. Um, however, business premises, business premises do get offered some very interesting speeds, especially when they're on industrial estates and such like that, you know, do create some phenomenal possibilities, but it's a very selective space. Um, and one of the things that I find interesting with 5G is with it being quite sort of um, short distance, actually the places that could really do with the speeds and opportunity um, are actually more, more the rural spaces. You know, um, um, here in the Northeast, uh, I, I, uh, I work um, closely with uh, Northumberland Council on, on a couple of things as, as a free advisor to them because I see the opportunity they have in that region. Um, but one of the challenges is actually connectivity. It is one of those places that suffers from it because it's such a, um, a broad area that has um, not very much population in certain areas, but an awful lot of livestock and natural beauty and stuff that does need to be monitored because impacts do create cost. Um, however, there isn't that, that sort of offer of support from um, the connectivity providers. I think that's a fair comment. In, um, in terms of coverage, that's, the, that's a fair comment. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of, the, one of the things that you, you one of the things that you will see though on that is that when so i'm there's a there's a cell a 5g cell site planning permission for a 5g cell site outside my my house right now mm -hmm. um and one of the things that you're going to see with uh high bandwidth wireless coverage is areas that get coverage will in many cases have by definition to have high bandwidth fixed line connectivity there to serve as backhaul mm -hmm. so it takes time for sure but in places where that doesn't currently exist, that inevitably will arrive. It, it has to, because without that, you can't really serve those areas. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I may eat my own, uh, own words, what I've just said, because um, the property that I am looking at to move into uh, in, the, in the next month uh, in a rural location in County Durham, uh, the broadband speed is 1.1 uh, meg um, from um, BT Openreach. Um, however, I've, I've done a bit of Googling and checked on the websites, and guess what? Allegedly, there is 5G from EE in the area. Um, so I'm going to try and put that to the yeah. test um, over the next weeks, and that might solve. Otherwise, I will be doing uh, the meetup from my car on the top of a hill somewhere. Um, so uh, it won't be video anymore. Hey, Adrian, thanks for reaching out. I found it really interesting, um, your, your, your questions and your suggestions following um, one of the talks that we had a couple of months ago, um, and you know your view on um, uh, the sun setting of 2G and 3G, which has always been something quite interesting to me. Um, with the telecom background that I have because it was sort of like I always felt like we were as, as telecom providers and stuff we were pushing 4G adoption um, but it was like sort of like everybody was starting to forget about all these devices that I knew that were out there because I'd helped customers put them out there um, that were using 2G and, and 3G so I think that leads very nicely onto your talk and again as I said I really appreciate you uh, offering to talk about this so over to you no bother let me see if I can present this. Uh, it says, let's see how look. Oh, host disable attendee screen sharing. Oh dear. Sorry, that was because you logged off. I'll, I'll uh, give you access again. Oh, okay, thank you. Right, okay, so let me listen to presentation mode. And share. 
so hopefully you should be able to see my share there. Okay. Or if I'm, double mute there, I'm still waiting for it to come through. Is, there, is anybody else getting it? Paul, can you hear me? Yeah, could, have you got me? Yes, I can. I can hear you. But let me. Yeah. We, let me we see are getting your screen can. through. It says it's start that you started a screen share, but we're just getting a black screen. All right. Let me try and share that. Got your video screen back. Yeah, sorry, the the web client crashed there. Give this another try. Okay, so share. There we go. Does that work? You can see the slides. I can see your PowerPoint. I'm not seeing the presentation screen. I don't know if you've started presenting yet. Yeah, let me try and present this way ah thank you microsoft okay um so can you all hear me now, buddy, yeah. see my slides yeah we can great stuff Okay, um, so so interesting enough, um, actually, uh, Matt um, just provided a presentation. Very interesting. So some of the key words that I took away from from that um, uh, were longevity, uh, infrastructure, security, and caveat emptor. Um, and the, so, Paul, con congratulations on on picking topics that seem to fit quite well together because those same topics appear in my presentation too. So what I'm here to talk about is the, the disappearance of 2G and 3G services um, from the IoT ecosystem uh, and whether there are potentially broader lessons that we can learn uh, from this, from the process of this happening. Uh, so just a little bit about me. So, uh, so I've worked uh, for Telefonica as is now since 1998. I uh, actually trained originally as a physicist uh, and then moved into engineering quite quite quickly after that. Uh, so I'm also a, uh, as, as a result of working in telecoms uh, and the, the, the specialisms that I've picked up over the, over the, the years, I work uh, in some of the GSMA working groups uh, around uh, IoT security and particularly some of the, some of the sunset matters. Uh, and also as an interested party in the Connected Living Group, uh, which I think has now changed its name to uh, IoT, uh, the Internet of Things Group. Uh, I'm also a, an IEEE ComSoc uh, member of the Public Volunteer Initiative, uh, which does uh, outreach and press commentary. So why are we talking about 2G sunsets? Uh, so lots and lots of... Uh, uh, cellular IoT connectivity is based on 2G uh, for some very good reasons, which we'll look at shortly. Uh, and the, the gold standard for communicating a, a sunset of a 2G or 3G uh, type of network is five years. Um, most operators offer one to three years notice. Uh, and unfortunately, some operators offer very little in the way of notice and that's actually the starting point in 2014 a couple of operators over in the asia pac region switched off 2g roaming networks without giving any notification whatsoever um, and that that started off some focus around essentially creating uh we we, we think of them as standards but essentially they're best practices uh, so essentially capturing what operators need to be doing to communicate this um, amongst themselves and also of course think about how you communicate with customers. Um, so that th there are multiple groups that have looked at this topic from different perspectives. So one of them has looked at them from the point of view of interoperator roaming agreements. 
another from the pure security aspects of 2G, thinking post Snowden world and how 2G is regarded as being not intrinsically secure. Um, and uh, other groups have looked at it from also different perspectives around how operators should uh, consider closing 2G networks. So very quickly, what do we mean by an IoT device? So essentially it's a device that does something useful that's connected and doesn't need a person to, to be there servicing it. Uh, so essentially that, that could include anything that's not consumerized voice for the sake of, for the, for the sake of simplicity. That's that essentially the, the kind of scenarios that we're talking about. Um, and this is just an example of a, this is a connected vehicle test board is, is all this in the picture. Uh, at, a, at a more abstract level, we have the ecosystem and within that we have devices and within the device we have the application component and the communications component. And what we're particularly interested in for our purposes here is the communications component. Uh, so why we're still using 2G in the IoT? Uh, it's very cheap, it's very friendly in terms of uh, power usage, you can, if you know what you're doing, uh, develop equipment that runs on two AA cells for as many as, as 10 years. Uh, it's a mature standard. It's been around for a long time. Developers quite like it because they understand it. Uh, there are lots of reasons to not use 3G, uh, whereas 2G penetration in the IoT is still fairly significant at 90% or so uh, in the legacy space, at least. 3G doesn't see much usage. And there are all sorts of good engineering reasons not to use 3G. So it's not very efficient with the power. It has all sorts of problems delivering reliable, stable coverage because of what we call cell breathing, uh, which I'll not talk about in detail uh, here, but it is a factor. The complexity of the, the silicon needed to provide 3G uh, also means that there's high cost silicon. So in a, in a fairly low cost machine to machine or IT type device, 3G is not really suitable. Uh, so what did 2G, 3G cellular networks look like? I, I suspect that people on this call might, on this uh, conference might have some insights into that. So I'll not talk through the cellular network architecture in detail, but it's there in the share for, for later reference. 2G dates to the early 1990s as a, as a production capability. 2G dates to the early 1990s and 3G dates to the early 2000s uh, in terms of being able to access the network as a capability. Obviously, the, the standards that underpin that technology are somewhat older. Uh, and today, 2G, 3G uh, infrastructure is heavily converged. So if, if you're using a 2G or 3G network, uh, in terms of what sits behind them, it's the same equipment. Uh, initially, deployments uh, three, for 3G were using different equipment, uh, but they are in, in the back end, they're, they're very much shared infrastructure. And that's in the diagram on the screen now. So what does global deployment, particularly of 2G look like? Uh, so the short version of this is that uh, penetration of 2G uh, by 2025 is expected to be below 10% of the total. That's the, that's the shortened version of what's showing there. You can draw conclusions initially from what that potentially means. How does that vary by region, by operators? Of course, there are 820 something operators globally uh, operating cellular type GSM networks, uh, and they all have different approaches to the timescales uh, around this. So what, I'm not here to talk about one specific operator, including the operator that I work for Telefonica, because they all have different stories. In some, in some respects, the, the more interesting story is what's happening globally. Uh, so it's worth noting there's a difference between 2G as a technology and 2G as a service delivered by operators. Uh, so from a, 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 an industry standard perspective, 2G was essentially uh, end of life, as it were, in 2015 uh, with the publication of a GSMA standard called PRDWA.01, um, which is from one of the working groups on which I sit, uh, and actually part of uh, I'm one of the co-authors uh, for the updated document that's coming out uh, in the near future. 3G essentially moved into that position this year and will be with the updated version of that document. Um, and as I say, effectively what we're doing is that we're really just recording uh, what operators have been doing uh, to this point. So 
there's no overarching standard that says in coordinated fashion operators should shut down legacy networks um, but these best practice documents do capture that this has been happening for a number of years and we call all these things sunsets uh, so it has been mentioned uh, in these sessions previously and, and i hear it a lot as well uh, that 2g will be around for ever or for a very long time and very often that's based on what operators have publicly announced to the media um, evidence-based research suggests a rather different picture so whilst on the left we have you can see the number of public announcements uh, for 2g 3g closures actually there's nearly an, an order of magnitude difference in some cases between what actually operators are uh, doing versus what has been declared via media channels um, when we say there's imminent risk of a network closing we mean within three years uh, and as i've said uh, already some operators will essentially close networks overnight with very little notification uh, the, the the history of this is is littered with examples since 2008 operators closing opera networks at, at short notice 30 days in some cases uh, the, the two operators i say that, that started this over in asia pack essentially closed networks overnight uh, for certainly for roaming purposes um, so it, it you will hear lots of people say 2g will be around forever and in some specific cases in specific niche applications it is true that 2g will persist for a long time smart metering is a good example however it's not guaranteed that those 2g networks and in some cases 3g networks will be available for everybody and that's because at the same one of the one of the things that happens on the way to a network being discontinued from service is that capacity is reduced uh, so the question becomes what does this have to do with sunsets and it's potentially worth looking at what the analogy means so when we think about a sunset we typically talk about the point in time at which the sun goes below the horizon and thus things get dark um, that's not quite how sunsets work of course um, the sunset actually starts think about the analogy here's measured intensity of sunlight through the day uh, this is an, an actual set of measurements taken you can see the reference there uh, sunset begins at about midday by which we mean after it's the brightest it can be in the day by definition everything's darker so if we think about what this means the analogy is actually quite appropriate sunset begins at approximately halfway through the life cycle of a particular technology and that makes degree of intuitive sense so it might be useful therefore to understand more about when we talk about sunset what would halfway point of a technology disappearing look like and in a cellular context what we tend to talk about is capacity that is when we start to remove capacity from a cellular network so start with the basics coverage is the ability to get signal um, greater signal strength is not necessarily the same thing as better service particularly in 2g and 4g networks in 3g yes to some extent it's it's true because of the, the power design of, of 3g but in, and certainly in data for 2g 3 2g 4g uh cell signal strength is is a very very poor uh, indicator for, for technology reasons i don't particularly want to get too far into but essentially when you have coverage type issues or signal strength disappearing for some reason what you find is increased bit error rates, BER, uh, and that's what causes a decrease in the measured transport and application layer throughputs. Signal strength in itself doesn't mean poor data service, um, and that's that is that is provably true. Um, the other aspect of providing a cellular service is capacity. So, of course, once we've got coverage, it'd be rather nice to be able to do something useful with it. And the ability to do that is defined by capacity. And more capacity can handle more voice calls, more data sessions, higher throughputs potentially. Uh, and this is about supply and demand. There needs to be at least enough capacity to provide uh, service for the demands of the uh, user estate that's accessing the network. Uh, 
And in practice, of course, operators tend to plan for peak capacity plus a little bit extra, um, which in tradition in the cellular world, actually, oddly enough, happens. So you've had coronavirus this year, things a little bit different. But historically, the, the busiest hour of the week for operators uh, in the West is Thursday, Thursday evening or Thursday night when people call for taxis uh, after having been out after work. Um, and that, that's how operators plan traditionally for service is, is peak capacity plus a little bit on top. The process by which capacity is removed from a cellular network um, is called refarming. We do that by refarming spectrum. What that means is the actual, the physical layer that's pushed across um, the air between the cell site and the uh, cellular device. What is happening is we are removing some of the, those carrier waves, moving them out of, in the case of 2G, into 3G and 4G, and out of 3G into 4G. Uh, there hasn't been refarming into 5G at this stage. Uh, but if, if you look at the, the technology to enable refarming, that's been around since the late 2000s uh, and operators have, in many cases, certainly where uh, telelot operators were, had, had rather developed uh, markets. Refarming has been happening for about 10 years now. Refarming of 3G spectrum uh, has been happening for at least five years, in some cases more aggressively. Uh, and these, these processes, uh, they attract regulatory oversight in many places. Uh, so these are not operators going it alone. These are somewhat regionally coordinated efforts. Uh, additionally, these capacity changes are not reversed. So when capacity is moved out of, say, for example, the 2G GPRS layer into 3G, for example, that capacity doesn't come back. What will happen eventually is that 3G capacity will be moved into 4G. Uh, and the reason for that, I think, is because consumers are buying smartphones. Uh, 4G is more spectrally efficient than 2G, 3G. You can do more with less, uh, providing voice remains a regulatory requirement. So one of the main reasons for the continued provision of uh, 2G voice, that 2G service in many networks is to provide voice service, which is a, a terms conditions of the, the license from the regulator. Uh, more recently, of course, as many customers have moved off 2G voice, that estate, the 2G estate now looks a lot more like IoT machine to machine. So the, the drivers behind maintaining 2G have changed in the last few years uh, to the extent that now operators will, as, as operators move towards 4G voice, voice over LT or Volti, um, 2G voice is less important, not needed as much. Uh, and the, the main driver is to have uh, service for uh, cellular uh, and machine machine IoT devices, promoting the packet switch layer, that is GPRS and Edge. There isn't much in the way of voice and machine to machine IoT, as you appreciate. However, there's still a fairly significant estate using circuit switch data, which again is a, is a, a topic I don't want to detour down too much at this stage, um, but cellular, uh, sorry, circuit switch data much like dial-up PSTN or dial-up internet access is, is way beyond end of life, way, way beyond. But we do still have people you find using it. So the answer to the question, uh, when does a sunset start around about halfway? What this implies for 2G is for a technology that came into, into being in production use in around about early 1990s, uh, 1994 for, for most UK operators that pins the the half life cycle at around about 15 years in 2010 so you can expect approximately speaking uh, 2g to last until about 2025 in some cases it will disappear before then and has been doing for a number of years in some cases it will run a bit longer but typically 2025 is about the expectation that most operators have um, is what we see from the evidence uh, for 3G, this implies, uh, implies a half-life half -life cycle uh, of somewhat less, maybe 11 or 12 years. So running from the early to mid 2000s to around about 2014, 2015, give or take. Um, and again, we can expect 3G to dis disappear probably overall a little bit later than 2G uh, in the late 2020s. However, 
some operators have said publicly that they will shut down and in fact already have shut down 3G in some cases, uh, particularly in the, in the Nordic regions, I think North, Northern Europe, uh, because they don't see the same drivers. Whereas uh, in 2G, there's a, a big machine to machine estate that justifies continuing to run a 2G network that same doesn't exist with 3G for reasons we've already established. What does this imply for 2G devices? Uh, so my experience has, has been that you tend to find people focus on the, the date at which 2G will shut down. Uh, and some operators don't have an answer for that question, at least not one that they're willing to share. And, and in some senses, actually, what you find is when, when, when people focus on the, the date at which network technology disappears, it can lead to a false sense of security. Uh, and what's I think more useful is to focus on what happens before then uh, because of course if you have capacity being stripped out refarmed over a period of time then you eventually start to see problems occur if you have too much capacity too much demand for the level of um, availability in the network uh, and at a certain point you get more demand than there is supply uh, and that's one of the reasons that uh, the conversations that we have uh, as telcos, as, as comms service providers with customers is we're, we're trying to explain the need to move away from these legacy technologies. Uh, and I appreciate that's not always welcome. Uh, in many cases, in truth, customers have already started to see service issues. So when, when refarming happens, it happens in tranches. Refarming is in, often accompanied by service issues. That is, that is reality doesn't necessarily impact uh, coverage you still have signal but capacity becomes a problem in localized uh, localized areas uh, and then as you start to head towards a point in time that there is just less capacity than there is demand for that capacity you start to see more widespread issues so it's very useful to focus not so much on when uh, the technology is started is going to disappear for, for good but when things are starting to potentially degrade service, uh, and we'll come back to the, the, that broader topic a little bit later. So what approaches do operators take to uh, making legacy networks uh, legacy? Uh, so there are, there are two that are worthy of time talking about. Uh, and one is to have reduced spectrum for a limited number of legacy users. Uh, with the understanding that eventually machine to machine IoT will eventually need to migrate into an alternative technology, which as, as cellular telco, as you might imagine, involves 4G, 5G type solutions. Uh, the other option is to just strip them out entirely. Uh, operators are free to choose whichever path they deem the most appropriate. Uh, there are other approaches, but I would say that they're niche and in many cases works in progress. Uh, in terms of in terms of the working group uh, activities to understand what these look like for different operators, I think there's there's still a degree of understanding to be to be gained to be had from what these different approaches look like. So, what do we need to think about for IoT solutions in the short term if they're using 2G? So, certainly new deployments don't use 2G, and that that is when when I when I speak with with people in the industry and I speak to customers new deployments using 2G is probably a, a bad idea um, and it, to return to Matt's theme about buyer beware, caveat emptor, one of the one of the issues that we see is as the market floods with cheap 2G silicon people look at this and go wouldn't it be wonderful if we equipped all our devices with cellular connectivity and there's, there's a there's a reason that 2G silicon is now so cheap. It's that essentially China is something like three quarters of the global market for these things and two thirds of the world's supply. And China, albeit they have pulled back from this a little bit of late for various reasons. Um, but when the Chinese authorities told the, tel the telcos uh, in their territory to consider what would happen in terms of 2G sunset, there was a degree of panic and, and people start to try and empty supply chains. So it, it is worth being, I would say, careful of bulk buying cheap 2G silicon at this 
stage. Existing deployments using 2G, uh, if this is something that hasn't been considered previously, you probably want to be doing an impact assessment to understand what it means for those solutions. Uh, on, on matter 3G, definitely don't deploy 3G. Definitely don't deploy 3G. Uh, uh, as we've seen, there are, there are good reasons to not use 3G anyway. Uh, what about 4G, 5G? So this is this is not the the thrust of my talk, uh, and I'm certainly not going to try and sell you a next generation or an evolved solution. It is worth saying that as telcos, this is this is the path. Uh, these are 2G replacements in IoT machine to machine space. Uh, so there are actually there are different flavors of 5G. One is mobile broadband, and that's that's the flavor that we are all familiar with. Uh, smartphones, dongles, cellular broadband routers, and so on and so forth. Uh, another another branch involves what's called URLC, uh, ultra reliable low latency communications, and that is that is I think as I said at the, at the beginning uh, to Paul, that is one of the I'd say probably one of the more exciting. Uh, spaces to to see what happens there. Most of those use cases, as we say, don't currently exist. But it's things like vehicle to everything communications, industrial IoT, emergency services. Those are the interesting use cases uh, that at, at the moment you do see people trying to deploy using 4G. 4G latency is probably a little bit too high for this stuff. Um, Yes, coverage is certainly a challenge. Backhaul infrastructure is certainly a challenge, but that I would say is the exciting area. Um, IoT, or what's called in 5G, massive machine type communications, uh, in, in terms of that. So the, one of the challenges with IoT, of course, is uh, restricted power, wanting to, to use batteries in many cases, uh, or sort of very low power source, uh, uh, very low power uh, devices. Uh, and one of the issues that the 5G waveform is something like three times more intensive in terms of the amount of energy it uses versus 4G. And if we're saying that full fat 4G is not good enough to do a power restricted IoT use case, sure as hell 5G is not going to cut the mustard there. So there is a branch of 5G looking at low power alternatives. Um, and in truth, those standards in many cases have not yet been created. Uh, some, of the, some of that is, is still a work in progress. We do know that much of what underpins that model will look like NBIOT and LTEM. Those protocol stacks exist for a reason. They will be forwards, backwards compatible with 5G for, for a long time to come. Um, and as and when there is a 5G uh, proper massive machine type communications protocol, it will look a lot like one or both those protocols. Um, so there's actually this is a this is a Telefonica slide. I couldn't find the original 3G PP one that, that uh, this is based on, but this is a that is a an industry wide view. Uh, if you if you do want to talk about NBIT, LTM, 5G MMTC in future, very happily talk about that stuff. It's not the main reason I'm here to, tonight to talk. What are comparable examples to 2G Sunset? Without leading out, reading out the whole list, uh, it's things like, for example, uh, the IPv4, IPv6 transition, the end of Windows XP. We can think of lots of examples. The one I like to pick on, because it has not happened yet, is the end of the first Unix epoch. Uh, and if you, if you work in IoT and I haven't come across this one, um, we, we probably should talk about it just very briefly. Uh, so. As an aside, briefly, the first Unix epoch, as some of you will know, I'm sure, I'm sure developers or uh, Unix heads uh, will, will, will recognize in the gray beards. Um, the Unix time runs from 1st of January 1970 uh, until towards the middle or sort of the start of 2038. Um, and this is a counter that is hardware based uh, and is based around a 64 bit clock gives you about 68 years of time. Um, and as you can see there, 19th of January 2038, anybody who's around to, to, to have recall of the Y2K, year 2000 problem, um, will we'll probably remember that Y2K was essentially a software problem uh, to do with decimal counting and not allowing uh, enough 
decimal digits in the counting. That's a software problem, or that was a software problem. Uh, and it was, relatively speaking, fairly straightforward to fix and patch. Uh, the end of the first Unix epoch, uh, it's likely if existing equipment continues to run until January 2038, is likely to be a significantly greater challenge particularly in kit that's embedded, ubiquitous kit, Internet of Things. Uh, and there is a very good reason that on your Android device, you can't set the clock manually past December 2037. A few years ago, I discovered if you did that, the device would crash um, because of this problem with a 32-bit version of uh, Nix. Apologies, 32-bit, not 64-bit, 32-bit. Um, and of course, that, that introduces all sorts of other security issues where if your telco managed to be hacked and broadcast a time that was outside the end of the first Unix epoch, horrible, horrible problems. You can Google what happens uh, or what used to happen if you set your Android device to February 2038. Um, it's, it, it, was, it was somewhat widely publicized at the time. Uh, IoT is really just a modern take on what we think, uh, what we used to call ubiquitous, ubiquitous or pervasive computing. That they bear lots of similarities. Um, some even argue that the start of machine to machine goes back to satellite communications, perhaps in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, what's different about the IoT now is the ubiquity of these things. So whereas you see some books there that I've pulled up from a bookshelf that talk about, that have literally schematic and circuit diagrams along with machine code examples for creating connected devices uh, from 1979, 1985, the very fact that we have that ubiquity today and the fact that costs of scale in a different way is, is going to contribute to the, to the success of the IoT. So whilst for sure it's not been quite as big as it looked like some people were saying in 2012, um, it, it is a measure of the success that we have to talk about these things. And the reason it's a problem is because if you are shipping an IoT device that's worth perhaps 100, 200 pounds, something like a a metering device or something of that nature, something that's not hugely expensive. Actually, the cost of an engineering field visit alone can often be greater than the cost of the device, the value of the device. Um, and that is that is certainly a problem. So the average field engineering field visit uh, in the space that I work in is between 90 and 110 pounds, so around about 100 pounds. Um, and that is troublesome for working at scale for obvious reasons, uh, very problematic. Uh, so there are significant implications from this potentially. For example, who pays for the rollout and recovery of devices? How long should an IoT solution be supported for? What is the longevity? In my in, in my uh, space, the median life cycle for an IoT solution is about seven years, but that's just the time it takes to make back the cost invested in the first place, the return on investment. Actually, solutions will typically run for many multiples of life cycles. So I, I have a partner who's been running a, uh, it's a, an alarm system, connected alarm since 2001 using GPRS, uh, still using GPRS. And they have run that for almost now two decades and were quite happily expecting to run for another 15 years uh, on 2G. Imagine the conversations that happen when that uh, is recognized to be not the case. There are all sorts of environmental considerations. So what happens to all the equipment? Uh, it's not beyond some companies to discover that a piece of kit that's not connected uh, maybe just is abandoned. Because of course, if you've got a, a hundred pounds worth of uh, engineering uh, cost to go and do a field visit, there's no obvious payback on that unless moving to the next point you can find different business model behind that and this is something that i'm sure many people have noted as well is that in the past you used to buy a piece of kit and then you would own it increasingly what you see in the iot ecosystem is this pay as you go model that is to say that there is a, an ongoing revenue stream where you perhaps for example rent a device for a very long period of time and eventually it pays itself back um, and perhaps as part of the deal as a sweetener 
uh, the customer might be offered at a certain point in time an upgrade to that device or a replacement with some additional bells and whistles, for example. The regulatory frameworks, as was mentioned by Matt, IoT regulation and IoT security regulation, in many places there they are already uh, statutes that exist around that. However, I can assure you they are on the way. So one of the GSMA working groups that I well, sit on, sat on until it was disbanded at the end of last year, at the start of coronavirus really, um, was the IT security working group. So we put together uh, some best practice guidelines, which were subsequently picked up by uh, governments, Australia, the US, uh, the UK, uh, and other places. And some of the IoT security frameworks that are now being uh, looked at by governments are based on um, the GSMA's security frameworks. They fed into some of the Etsy security frameworks uh, as well. Uh, and, and together those were picked up by governments. Uh, I can assure you, Bruce Schneer has been talking about this stuff for many, many years. IoT security regulations and things like making sure that equipment's not abandoned and that it can be serviced. Those things are on the way, absolutely. Uh, and my, my favorite hobby horse is security uh, and privacy and safety uh, and what those standards and best practices should, should look like. So how do we get here? I'm not gonna read out the entire slide, but fundamentally, uh, this is a, a, a process called infrastructuralization, which essentially when products and services and platforms get provided and used in a certain way, uh, and they over time become, in some cases, indistinguishable from infrastructure. So you're thinking about, for example, a Google. Imagine how today one might use the internet if Google didn't exist. In some circles, Google, Google is regarded, regarded as critical infrastructure. Um, a similar comment applies to things like WeChat, where in China, WeChat is used for everything, absolutely everything, used for payments, borrowing books, uh, tracking people, or a plugin that tracks people who have suspected coronavirus. WeChat is fundamental to many parts of uh, society in China today. And this is interesting because telcos, operators, deliver things like 2G as a service. But in the IoT space, when we build or develop a solution, we often treat that as infrastructure. It's something that's there, always has been, and isn't going anywhere quickly. There are different perspectives on what constitutes infrastructure. Uh, and there's a, a whole body of research that indicates that products and services evolve and innovate much more quickly than does infrastructure. Innovation is a key part of the fourth industrial revolution, of which IoT is a big part, um, and it would be quite nice to learn from the history in there. And you can see some of the quotes. So from the Harvard Business Review, innovation risk, the reality is that changes in infrastructure usually lag changes in products and services, and that imbalance can be a major source of risk. And this is what we're talking about fundamentally, is when we're developing against any comms capability that might be regarded as infrastructure, we are putting ourselves at risk um, because there is a mismatch between the rate at which the product or service evolves and the infrastructure evolves. And if they don't match up nicely, one or other is going to be a problem. Uh, and again, we see longevity is the key to achieving the economies of scale that enable investing in IT broadly and deeply throughout the market. Without longevity, only very high return applications are worth investing in, uh, investing in, but with it, a vast field of savings opportunities open up. That's from 2016. So again, this theme of longevity. So how can we handle these sorts of issues? Um, so let's assume for the sake of argument that we do care about this because of course some people may not some people may just want to put a product in the market take the customer money and go uh, and i certainly i don't judge don't judge that but let's assume for the sake of argument that we do care about these things so the first thing we could look at is what's the life cycle of the entire solution how long does it take to uh, return on investment uh, so how long does it take then to make a profit is it one life cycle is it two life cycles 
from an engineering perspective, what are the life cycles of the individual components? And that's obviously not limited to the comms module in the device. So I already mentioned the end of the first unit's epoch. Uh, for example, if you develop a, a, an application with an application uh, functionality that depends on, for the sake of argument, the time value derived from a 32 bit version of Linux or Unix, are you protected if you intend to run this solution for 20 years? Because we are now significantly closer to the end of the first Unix epoch than we are to the end of the last century. It's worth noting. Uh, it, it's easily it's easily overlooked, but we are 20 years away from Y2K. We are a lot less than 20 years away from end of the first Unix epoch. These things can be foreseen in many cases. Uh, so I'm certainly not going to talk about talk through these in great detail but some of the techniques that we might use uh, risk management methods uh, this is uh, it's the it's the unknown unknowns uh, anybody who's worked in engineering for a while will have seen this approach to risk management uh, in pop psychology you might have heard it called the jahari window it's actually it's fundamentally the same technique and don't be put off by some of the political associations uh, from way back when it is a valid technique absolutely any more techniques? Uh, scenario planning, that is essentially where you look at possible future scenarios and then work backwards to find out how you got there and then set up points in time along the, the, the path that you lay out. So you can monitor and establish through industry trends or changes that are happening in behavior, for example, the customers, then you can work out which of these paths you might be on and thus potentially take corrective action. Uh, I don't want to talk through the details of scenario planning. There's plenty of uh, material out there from the interest in, in taking this approach. It is valid, it does work, um, but it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit niche topic. Uh, my own approach is an, an engineering approach. It's to look at uh, information security practices. That is to say, talk about availability and confidentiality and integrity. Uh, it's often called the CIA triad. Um, and fundamentally, this is about availability. Availability underpins everything that we do. If a network service is not available, you have no availability. So availability is, of, availability is often regarded as an operational concern. That is to say, I have however many switches it takes to guarantee uh, have five nines, six nines uptime. However, imagine a situation where, for some reason, those switches are suddenly removed you have gone from 99.999% availability in your switch network to 0% availability because the equipment has disappeared or doesn't work anymore. So availability is more properly treated as a strategic concern, a strategic imperative. You want to avoid a situation where it becomes possible to go from five nines to 0% or 100% guaranteed downtime forever. Um, and information security brings a whole suite of best practices uh, for, for people who know how to use them. Um, I wouldn't suggest that business continuity planning is necessarily one of them. I think that the life, the, the, the cycle over which BCP works about five years is probably not sufficient if your median life cycle is seven years. But there are techniques that can be used. Um, and some coming towards the end of the slide, some more thoughts about security. So if security by design and also to satisfy GDPR, for example, privacy by design and not fundamental to an IoT design, then they need to become the top priority. Um, and controversial in some circles, minimum viable product, MVP, is not always your friend, um, particularly when you are talking about things like security. Um, so I, I was asked last year, late last year, to, to start work on a, a solution for smart water utility. So this was for a million smart water meters. Um, and the product owner came along and showed me that the, the network technology that was to be used had been decided, the equipment had been decided, the vendors had been picked, everybody was lined up to accommodate this need. Um, and I as solution architect was asked to take away these components and glue them all together in a way that worked. Um, actually, one of the one of the problems with this is that 
the, the customer in the, their uh, specification required security as a very minimum. Uh, and this solution had no security. This is, bear in mind, this is water metering infrastructure, had no way to guarantee encryption of data. So there's no confidentiality, no integrity. If you are measuring somebody's utility, you definitely want to know that what's being measured is accurate and hasn't been tampered with. Um, and bolting, so we, we, did, we did manage to come up um, with a solution, myself working on the cellular networking side and one of my colleagues working on the IT side, we did manage to come up with a solution. But actually developing simply just the security aspects of this turned out to cost more than the whole of the rest of the solution um, because we're trying to bolt it on afterwards. And this is absolutely not to take a pop at any particular technology. The technology chosen to deliver this uh, capability was NB-IoT. And the reason we had problems with this is because NB-IoT is really bad with asymmetric encryption. That is things like TLS. You need a, a capability uh, like LTEM. What had happened is that the equipment vendor uh, had focused incorrectly on NBIOT in a different region because the, the customer in that location, a different part of the world, didn't need any encryption on their water metering solution. I don't know why that's the case, but they didn't. Uh, and what had happened is the literally the comms equipment did not fit in the plastic manifolds of the uh, meters of the, on the boundary of the properties in the UK. And that is literally the deciding factor. Uh, and as a consequence, it was impossible to engineer, reverse engineer security in this within a, a sensible timescale and within sensible cost. You have to make security the first priority. If there is no security requirement, fantastic, wonderful. Truthfully, it's hard to think of a, a solution nowadays that doesn't need security. Um, I'm very, very nervous when people say solution doesn't need security because at some point it probably will. And probably that will be because the laws change to say IoT has to have a minimum grade of security uh, through some sort of best practice. For example, those that are laid out by governments based on industry standards and best practices. Uh, I think one more, yes, one more slide. Uh, so what else can go wrong? Uh, sometimes poor engineering uh, can lead to uh, nothing more severe than degraded service. Uh, I'm working with a customer uh, who's uh, at the moment who's allowed a device to be compromised using public addressing and they've been compromised and sent £100,000 worth of SMS fraudulently. Uh, and then we have examples where uh, these solutions are used in safety critical systems. So uh, everybody's probably aware of the Jeep vehicle hack a few years ago. Matt mentioned it too. There are cases where e-health uh, panic alarms uh, that operate across uh, the traditional networks, 2G and PSTN, where the calling identity, the CLI, has been lost uh, as a result of changes that have happened in the network. As a consequence, the alarm receiving center was unable to tie the location of the device to the location of the person. And at coroner's inquest, people have been found to have died with one of the contributory factors being the operator who received the, the emergency call could not locate the person because the CLI went missing. So if we don't consider availability as a, as a key part of the fundamental design IT solutions, um, you will find in some cases very, very bad things happening. Uh, so that is the last slide. Apologies for overrunning slightly there. Oh, no problem, Adrian. I think we, we got started a little bit later than, than normal. Um, thanks very much for that. It was really insightful. Uh, I can't hear you, Paul. Anybody else can?
Sorry, was I on mute that whole time? What a nightmare. Um, does yes. anybody have any questions for Adrian? <laughs> if anybody's still here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very late. Ah, Alistair, my understanding is that 4G oh, yeah. uses 3G for voice calls. We now have voice over LTE on some new phones, but mm. for far from all according to my quick search uh, just now. How does this fit with retiring 3G? Will, it, will a form of 3G need to continue alongside 4G for a little longer to support voice calls? Really good question, Alistair. That's a very insightful question. The short answer is yes. Uh, so what's happening is that a, a Volte might, so for those not aware, 4G is a, a pure data network um, and doesn't support voice. There are two modes by which voice can be made to work. Uh, so let's, let's put aside things like Skype and Teams, all that over the top stuff. The first is by falling back from 4G to 2G, 3G. That is called circuit switched fallback. Uh, and that is the current mode of operation in 4G networks where voice is also needed. However, there is another standard, Volte voice over LTE, which is native voice over a data connection. It's voice over IP, but turned into a cellular context. The migration path, so what happens, what needs to happen is the, the 4G core network is very different to the 2G, 3G core network very, very different. Um, and actually moving across to this IMS, this evolved core um, is slow and expensive. Um, and speaking from some experience is not an easy thing to do. So yes, the a Volte migration for a large voice estate where there is close regulation of things like voice quality. So in the UK market, for example, a full Volte migration might take five or six years um, so having said earlier that voice is something that the regulators take very seriously, um, it is not feasible for networks in this part of the world, for example, to switch off 2G voice, 3G voice for a number of years because the Volte migrations haven't been successfully completed yet. Um, so yes, that is, that is one of the things that will cause 2G, 3G to persist for a good few years yet. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks for the insight. Uh, any more questions from anyone? Excellent. Uh, Matt, um, Adrian, thank you very, very much for your time this evening. I'm sure everybody's found it as insightful as I did. Um, as usual, the recording will go up on the website. Um, by all means, please do like and share and do follow us on IAS, um, IOT North U on Twitter. Um, and you'll be able to find us at IOT North um, on uh, LinkedIn as well. Any questions, anybody that would like to talk, um, please do email me directly, paul at iotnorth.uk. And um, we have a really interesting um, uh, talk in October. We have Rover Robotics um, speaking about um, their robot and um, utilizing um, computer vision um, and doing uh, stock taking. Uh, thanks very much, everybody, and have a great month. Bye-bye.